as you know, we have been following Jesus chronologically, and we're up to chapter 6, and in chapter 6 of Matthew, which is his Sermon on the Mount, and we just finished the Lord's Prayer, just finished it. So, the next step would be, wait, pause, ah, there are sometimes I get a question from someone or someone makes a comment about something and it kind of initiates a change of direction for a brief period of time where I believe I that the Lord is moving me to cover uh, a topic that I wasn't anticipating. For example, in the past, those of you who've been with us for a while, you know, we had a season where I spent, I think, about eight weeks on heaven. And those of you who were with us even earlier, I guess, kind of early last year, I think the spring time frame, I spent 12 weeks on finances. So sometimes something comes up, hits my spirit, and I believe this is what we're supposed to cover. Well, that has happened this week. So I want to give a shout out to Pastor Joshua Gutwa of uh, the Riamena, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, the Riamena Fellowship Church in Kisi, Kenya. Angelique and I were chatting with him, and he had a question about Satan and his temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. And in answering, when Angelique and I were talking to him, answering some of his questions, I realized, you know what? It's been a long time since I covered this issue. And this issue is a big deal uh, because I have seen, whether it's in developed nations or developing nations, whatever, the misconceptions and the misunderstandings related to the accuser, Satan, in, in, the, in the Bible and the Greek, it's Diablos, which is also translated as the devil, which means the accuser, if you look up the translation in the Greek. And we have a, a misunderstanding of how the accuser operates, what our enemy can and cannot do. And I was getting in my spirit, you know what? I had talked to Pastor Gutwa and I said, hey, I know I did a series on this a number of years ago, so I'm going to send that to you. And in going back and finding the series and going through it, I said, you know what? I'm going to up, update it uh, in a sense as you sometimes see, see with records. Or, oh, gosh, I'm dating myself and then no one knows what records are unless they're like our age. With Music releases, you sometimes hear about a song that has been remastered. So I went back and actually kind of remastered this. And I said, you know what? I'm not just going to share this with Pastor Gutwa, but I'm also going to share this with the congregation because a lot of folks in the congregation were definitely not around almost eight years ago, back in 2015. Actually, I did this in the in May, May, I think it was May 17th, back in 2015. So we're actually going to take a pause from Matthew 6 and rewind, go back a number of years, back to Matthew 4, the beginning of Matthew 4, and we are going to go through all of the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness by the devil. So we can have a proper understanding of who our enemy is, because we must know our enemy. Chapter 1, verse 12. Mark 1, verse 12. And I'll quickly read what we did last week and kind of bring you up to speed. Again, we're following, we're still following the New Testament chronologically. So we're still going, same thing. So we're, Jesus is 
his baptism is over. And the first thing that he does, or that he that is done, is that, excuse me, the Holy Spirit immediately drives him into the wilderness. The Holy Spirit immediately drives him into the wilderness. The Spirit, and this is NLT, and depending on your translation, drive can be something else, but in this, the NLT says, the, the Spirit then compelled Jesus to go into the wilderness. Compelled Jesus to go into the wilderness. And again, we talked about uh, a little bit last week about, again, the Holy Spirit is what guides us, moves us, uh, helps us to know where to go. But on purpose last week, I left something out. On purpose, because I wanted to specifically talk about this topic. And it's interesting, I was thinking this week, sometimes people, well, what's your church about sometimes? You, you get that, what is it about? Now, I think I answered that to someone recently, well, again, it's the glorify God, but every squadron, I don't use that term depending on who I'm talking to, but for us, we know what we're saying. Every congregation, everybody's different. As, as Tracy was saying, everybody's different, so every congregation will be a little bit different. I am a teacher. That's what I do. And so the focus here is to raise people up to go out and disciple, to really go out and disciple and be able to disciple others. So to hear, I, I, think, I think of them as my children, to, for them going out and actually, my players going out and actually just doing, doing what we talked about we've, for years we've been talking about. And them doing that, that's, that's what it's all about. That's, what, that's how we grow. That's how you grow a church, is that you've got to teach people to be able to have the ability to stand on their own. And depending on their God-given gifts, personalities, those sorts of things, my job, by the power of the Holy Spirit, and what I've been gifted, is to help them to reach that potential God's given them and to have that focus in that area. The other thing is, I wish I, I don't have it, I am very big, very big on the battle. I'm very big on that. So go to Matthew, I left out specifically, because Matthew 4, chapter 1, says almost the exact same thing. Whoever gets there first, I'd like them to read that. Chapter 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Yes. He was tempted. Let all the other stuff that it says in Mark, and Mark says it as well, but I wanted to use Mark one twelve because it leaves out that one part. Because today we're going to talk about the devil. Let's pray. Father God, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, you have overcome all things. Please help me to communicate the proper balance on the topic for today. Uh, the topic we, where uh, a lot of Christians kind of gloss over it, sometimes put too much emphasis on it, uh, help me to strike that proper balance. In Jesus Christ's name I pray, amen. So the first thing we're going to do is, okay, we're, as always, since again, remember, it's a congregation, I'm a teacher, so we have class participation. So it's better to volunteer usually than to, but I'd like to know, in your words, not what you necessarily know or believe, but in your experience talking to people in your sphere of influence, who do they believe Satan or the devil to be? And if some people that you know think that he doesn't exist or something, that's fine too. Everybody, anybody in your sphere of influence, what, what have you heard, what do you see? Anybody willing to share? Oh, yeah. 
young lady over here? Um, I think it's sometimes a joke for them. Like, they they admit, they talk about it, but they don't really think he's real. Or if they do, they just joke around with it to make it so they're not scared, I guess. Mm. Like, Ouija boards and stuff, they think that it could be real, but they think it's a ghost and not necessarily the devil. Okay. Anybody else? We have? No, ladies first. Uh, this is actually a discussion that was sparked because I was on a Netflix binge, but <laughs> there was a really interesting portrayal of the devil um, as far as, you know, from the, a Catholic standpoint. And I've never heard it before, but it was very interesting and it caused like a 30 minute discussion with my roommates. <laughs> um, but basically, s most believe that he's just kind of, like she said, just kind of made up, not really a thing. You know, there's good and evil, quote unquote, but it's because we make it that way, not an actual presence. But mm. this person's point of view is that the devil is very much real, but can take many forms. And so is constantly present in a sense. And I just, thought it was unique. I don't, I'm not doing a good job of explaining it, but it was just very different portrayal that I've heard before. So That's actually not too bad, actually. Kind of at the opposite extreme of what Kylie was talking about. I've encountered people who seem to think of the devil as God's foe and almost on an equal footing with, right. with God, not subject to God, but but on an equal footing where, where there's a, a struggle back and forth and we sure hope God wins. <laughs> right. I agree with that. I hear that. I think especially in the media because it's commonly um, you know, humorized. So both the devil and hell are, might, are made to be you know, mostly just jokes and they're not really something that anyone's actually afraid of. You know, that's how we got, like, the cartoon, you know, horns and tail and, uh, right, pitchfork and whatnot. And then also hell is just, I mean, it's, like, it's supposed to be bad, but it's not really taken as such. Like, most, a lot, and I think that because it's so commonplace in the media, which is generally a place that lacks Christ completely, that's what's being seen by people. And so there's no real fear behind it in most of the people that I encounter. Um, and if it's not, it's the other way around, I think, like Mr. A said, where it's, you know, kind of good and evil, but, you know, good good and evil are pretty much like equal forces, equal. and good's just going to barely, you know, tough it out because that's what happens. So, yeah. Now, my next question, that was in your general sphere of influence. What do Christians in your sphere of influence say, communicate, talk about when de Satan? What has been your experience? Any time for some younger Christians, especially, I guess, like, so our age group, mm -hmm. um, any time I've mentioned spiritual warfare to some of them, they just kind of give me the look. <laughs> and they don't really believe it's a thing at all. And they, they believe in God and they believe in Jesus, but they don't believe his power or the opposite power either. And so they're just kind of... They don't believe all the truth, I guess. <laughs> I like that. Oh, just go over there. Um, I've seen the other extreme. I think it just depends on the person and, like, the community and stuff. But um, one extreme is that, like, everything bad is from the devil. <laughs> and, like, <laughs> no, we still have flesh. And, you know, what I mean? it can be just yourself. And, right. you know, not really understanding that, like, um, we do have, like, a ba like our flesh and that we're, like, trying to overcome that and stuff. Right. And then also just, like, every struggle in life, like you have a cold, it, thinking that <laughs> might be spiritual attack, and it's like, that, that could be, you know, just like that we get cold sometimes, and like, it's like, so it's just funny, right. like, seeing the opposite extreme where they think everything is That's true, thing. that's true. Anybody else? Okay. Well, today, the reason, since in our walk as we go through this, okay, there's this new person entity on the stage, Satan, that is on the stage. So we are going to take the time to frame it properly. What does scripture say who Satan is? Okay. 
So go to Revelation 12, verses 3. We're going to do 3 through 17. I will, I will read through that. Chapter 12, verse 3. Now, there's a lot here I'm not going to do. <laughs> there's so much once I finish. There's so much. You could spend months on some of this, talking about the allegory and everything. But I'm, I'm going to focus on some, of, some specifics here. Then I witnessed in heaven another significant event. I saw a large red dragon with seven heads and ten horns with seven crowns on his heads. His tail swept away one-third of the stars in the sky, and he threw them to the earth. He stood in front of the woman as she was about to give birth, ready to devour her baby as soon as it was born. She gave birth to a son who was to rule all nations with an iron rod, and her child was snatched away from the dragon and was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where God had prepared a place to care for her for 1260 days. Then there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. And the dragon lost the battle and he and his angels were forced out of heaven. This great dragon, the ancient ser serpent called the devil or Satan, the one deceiving the whole world, was thrown down to earth with all his angels. Now we're going to continue more with this, but I'm going to pause here because I wanted to say it is specifically, explicitly said here that the dragon is Satan. And that the dragon has angels, or Satan has angels who follow him, who fought for him against God's angels who were represented by the archangel Michael. And there was a war in heaven. And Satan and his angels lost and were forcibly removed from heaven. Okay? Okay. This is not for debate, because there's some things, for example, about the seven crowns. and seven, I'm not getting into that, okay? Because there's a lot of people who have different feelings or beliefs about what that represents, who that is, whatever. That I'm not talking about today. What I specifically want to go, where there isn't any debate theologically, we're going to go, I'm going to talk about some other theological debates and bring that up as far as what people think as well. But this one's very clear. Satan is an angel. It's no debate about this. This, if you believe the Bible, okay, so this is mainly with Christian, and there was a war. And they were thrown to earth forcibly. Now we're going to read, how did he receive that? Satan. Then I heard a loud voice shouting across the heavens. It has come at last, salvation and power in the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down to earth. You hear Satan called the accuser. This is specifically the accuser of our brothers and sisters. These are those who follow Christ. It's us. Okay. The accuser of the brethren, which you've heard many times has been thrown down, the one who accuses them before our God day and night. I want you to hear that, who continues to accuse day and night. And they have defeated him by the blood of the lamb and by their testimony. I want you to understand the reason that we are victorious is by the blood of the lamb. And without that, we lose. And those who are not covered by the blood of Christ are losing, whether they think they're winning or not. That is the only power that enables us to be successful. You have to, this is one of the things we have to understand. Satan has been around for a very, very long time. 
and we're going to talk about some of the things that he does. For us to believe that we can outwit Satan and his angels in our own strength is the epitome of delusional hubris, okay, or pride, and delusional pride. I mean, it's beyond, it's beyond understanding. Now, trust me, I was part of the delusional hubris society, okay? I actually was a, a found, I well, can't say I was a founding member, but I totally believed I could do everything on my own. It's only in Christ and by his power that you can. Now, here's the hard part. Talking about us. And they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. We cannot love our time on this planet at this particular so much that we aren't afraid to give this life for Christ. That's where there's so much power, there's so much freedom. When you know, you know to the no, to the no, to the no, that you are going to live for the rest of eternity. And this body is just a shell, and you have a, a mission for this time that God has called you to do. And when the mission is over, you're ready to go. When it, whenever that is. I'm not saying that's easy. But again, I'm just reading from Scripture. So you, you want to say something, you can say it to the Holy Spirit. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who live in the heavens rejoice, but terror will come on the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you in great anger. Honey, I'm going to use the P word for emphasis. He is pissed off. I mean, he is angry with a heart attack and heartburn and all other things put together. And we, we must understand this. Every day, you get up. It's his mission in life. Even though he knows he is lost, his mission in life is to do everything in his power to disable, destroy, even, for example, he knows he can't take your salvation, but he wants to make you as inefficient, isolated as possible. Do whatever he can, and anyone who's not God's at this time is to do everything in his power to make them want to keep going down the path they're going and keep them away from you if, you are actually have the power of God flowing through you. He has no power. Now, again, we have to understand, just because you call yourself a church, Satan has no challenge going to think places that say C-H-U-R-C-H. If there's no power of God there, he has no challenge going there, sitting on the front row going, hallelujah, thank you me, because there's no Jesus there. He has no challenge with that. He can go touch, quote unquote, the holy water because it's just tap water. There's no, there's no power there. Knowing that he has little time. When the dragon realized that he had been thrown down to earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But she was given two wings like those of a great eagle so she could fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness. There she would be cared for and protected from the dragon for, for a time, times, and a half a time. I'm not going into what that means. <laughs> then the dragon tried to drown the woman with a flood of water that flowed from his mouth. But the earth helped her by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that gushed out from the mouth of the dragon. And the dragon was angry at the woman and declared war against the rest of her children. All who keep God's commandments and maintain their testimony for Jesus. Okay. Folks, let us be clear. Very clear. We're at war. 
And one of the things I talked about, my passion, you talk about an emphasis. Emphasis for this congregation, and my, my elders at the time shot me down on this, and it's a good thing. I much prefer that logo. I, my logo at first were dog tags, okay? It was like there was a, a, a stylized dog tags would be the church in Warrington. It was like they're all beat up dog tags and you had chunks out of it and stuff. I still have it. I said, bring it up one time. And we're going to give out dog tags to people who kept coming, you know, as members and stuff. We still may do that. I, I still got to, I got to, now that I have Chris here, maybe I might win the vote this time. I lost two to one. So I might do that. So if we get two to two, if it's two to two, I think as a senior pastor, I could break ties. I, I don't know. We didn't put that in the bylaws, so I don't know. Maybe we have to do rock, paper, scissors or something to be able to do that. But I, that's the mindset. So if you're here, that, you're going to hear that from me. People, you wake up, you're, you're, first of all, we're at war, and you're in enemy lines. Okay? Since we, again, I, due to time, I'm not going to go. If you go back to Genesis 3, we had dominion, we gave up the dominion. We gave up the dominion. So God's in control. Please hear me. God still has authority over here. But Satan, in a sense, has dominion to a certain extent, okay? Only what God will give him. As Mr. A said, we have all these things like God's not in control. Read Job. Satan can't do anything unless God allows it, okay? Satan can't do anything. If you go back to Job, Satan had to go to God and say, uh, Job loves you so much because you just give him everything. I'm telling you, he would spit in your face if you just, just take that hedge around. And God said, okay, I'll take the hedge off. But Satan couldn't go and do and overcome God. He can't do that. Read the Bible. Jesus, yeah, Jesus goes Good, goodbye and demons like psh, scatter. That's the power that's in you. So, again, when you talk about, I see horror movies, it's like, you know, it's good, evil, good, evil. It's just, and, you know, evil can beat sometimes or whatever. No, 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 there's nothing that can keep God from getting accomplished what he wants to get accomplished. So I, I, we need to have that mindset. And one of the things I want to, could you show the slide? The slide. The, the, of the picture of the guy. There he is. Does anyone know who that is? Attila the Hun. Good guess. Good guess. That is not Attila the Hun. Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan. That is another good one. Anyway, I love these guesses. It is a guy. That's true, but... So, yes. Ooh, yes. Look at that. Okay, now let's see if you know who Sun Tzu is. Sun Tzu. I don't know much about Sun Tzu. So Sun Tzu is Chinese. You were Art of War... The, there you go. Wrote a really well, so you know, pretty I, much famous book of war. Yes, pretty much that. Okay, I, I I owe you something for that. That's worth the you know milkshake something. Well, very very good. Sun Sun Tzu, Sun Tzu, six sixth century BC, wrote a book called The Art of War. Okay, The Art of War is one of the most famous military books to this day, which is still studied. Now. One of the things is that if you understand that we are at war, okay, and this is one of the things you got to get, we are at war. Whether we want it to be, it doesn't matter. That's the deal. So we're in it. So sometimes you can learn things from people who aren't necessarily Christian. Not, I'm not saying I agree with everything in the art of war or anything, but please put up the quote that he, he had which I think is great, excellent. Is that what you were saying? I have this written down. You have this? Oh, okay. I would suggest this is a great quote, okay? If you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles, okay? Please understand that. If you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know yourself, but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer a defeat. And if you 
know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. In every battle. One of the things I've noticed, again, I, I don't know this, again, coming from, as being a heathen and a pagan, when you just read the Bible, it talks about Satan all, it talks about Satan a lot. If you go through it, it's throughout Old Testament, New Testament, whatever, and says what. So when I just read it, because I wasn't polluted by any Christian church or something at the time, because I just read it, and I'm being nice, just tongue in cheek, it's a great trade, don't write me any letters. It's a great churches out there, but many times I would go to church and people just wouldn't talk about it. It just never come up in a sermon or what, or if the thing was mentioned, no one would really even talk about it. If you're in business, or for me, I'll use what I'm even more familiar with. As a coach, if I have an opponent, if I go and prepare for an opponent that we're going to play, whether it's basketball or football or whatever it is, one, one of the things everybody knows, what do you do? You get film study, you study your opponent, you know what they like to do, you know what they don't like to do, you know what they're strong at, you know what they're weak at. But with Satan for Christians, we know, have no idea for, most, for the most part. You go and ask, oh, what, who say, what does he do? And like you said, you heard what it was. How are we actually going to actually be successful? Now, overall, please understand, the war is over. But if anyone knows history, lots of times in wars, there are still battles that happen, really tough battles, that after the armistice has been signed. So our war is over, but there's still battles that are going to be done until Christ comes back. But we don't take the time to really understand our enemy who is at war with us, whether you want to acknowledge it or not. You must know, you know, as I tell my students, you don't have to. You don't must know. Okay, I take that back. If you want to be successful, you must know. You must prepare. You must know what he's going to do. Before it's there. So then if you know, and you know yourself, you know your God, and that's know ourselves, we must know God. And if you take time to know God, you're going to know about Satan because it's discussed there. But the main thing we're going to cover today, or a couple, as I can't say I'm quite summing up yet, but four things to know what Satan is going to do. To know what Satan's going to do. And I'm going to ask, there's... Three, no, four, excuse me. I'm going to do the last one, but would someone turn to John 8, 44? Would someone do 2 Corinthians 11, chapter 11, verses 3 and 14? Okay. 3 and 14, and 2 Thessalonians Chapter 2, verse 9. Again, John 8, 44. Which one do you have? John. Okay, I need someone for 2 Corinthians, chapter 11. Okay. And someone for 2 Thessalonians 2, 9. Anyone for 2 Thessalonians? Okay. 2, 9. So, Kyle, you're first. And I'll pause to talk about each one of those. You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. The first thing we must understand with Satan is that he lies. He lies, he lies, and he lies. How do you figure out, how do they teach people how to find counterfeit bills? Does anyone know how they teach people to do that? You were in a bank. They make them study intently what the real thing looks like. They make them study what is the real thing. One of the challenges we as Christians, why we fall for many of Satan's lies, is that we don't know what the truth is because we do not study it intently. We don't do it 
over and over and over again. Every day, studying the Word of God, knowing what God says, to know what the truth is, to show ourselves approved. We cannot stand up to the lies of the enemy without knowing the truth. And it's hard work. When you are a soldier, and I have not been a soldier, but there's a lot in our sphere of influence are soldiers. There's not one of them I say, wow, this is really easy. It's a cakewalk being this Marine thing. As we know, we have uh, Max Pride is, is doing, we know David, Ho, a whole bunch of people are in it. There was none of them said, hey, wow, this was so much easier than I thought it was. Okay, ask Kelly about that when we go see her. At, uh, no, it is hard work. When you are a Christian, it is hard work. It's part of the deal. And we can't shy away from that, make us, oh, you know, when you become a Christian, it's just so wonderful. Yes, there are, it is wonderful. But it's hard work wonderful. Okay, it's hard work wonderful. Next, Corinthians, you have Corinthians? Okay. 3.18. But I am afraid that just as the serpent deceived Eve by his treachery, your minds may be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. And 14. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. We have to understand deception. I said lying, and kind of a subset of lying, but I, I think it's important enough, so I'm categorizing it differently is he is a master of deceiving. He is a master of deceiving. He is a master of taking what God says and twisting it just slightly. Making it sound like it's almost God and actually having qu sometimes quite a bit of truth. Sometimes he will quote exactly the truth. In Genesis, he said, God didn't say you will die, which he did. But Satan knew that you, Eve wasn't going to, quote unquote, physically die. So that actually, that part was the truth. And he uh, prayed on the fact that she really, and she then, we're going to talk about this more, what he prays on. I just want to talk about what he does. But he deceives. We're, later on, again, promo for future weeks. We're going to talk about what he did with Jesus during this time as Jesus goes in the wilderness, what he said to Jesus. One of the things he said to Jesus was scripture word for word, exactly as it was quote, as it was written in the Old Testament canon. Exactly. And he used it seemingly in the right way. That happens to us. And it goes back again, knowing God's truth and knowing all of it. And that's why you have to know all the Bible. Because if you just know a piece of the Bible, Satan will be able to manipulate that. He knows it backwards, forwards, this way, that way. He knows his Bible. He will be able to use it. And if you don't know the entire context, and that takes time, but you have the Holy Spirit to help you, even when you don't know certain things yet. But if you're not taking the time, you will be deceived. It's not a might. It's not a maybe. It's going to happen. So you must be diligent in that. Second Thessalonians 2.9. Two nine. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders. And I think, I think was it Jillian or somebody was saying that, you know, everything, oh, or it might have been Lauren, is that sometimes we give all, like, we get a cold, get a toenail thing. It's, oh, Satan is after me. I got my ingrown toenail. Stop, I, heal, get, get away from me, Satan. It's like in everything. But we'll say that. But it talks about this, and there's other places in the Bible. And this is uncomfortable for people. Go back to Job. Satan... Satan was able to whip up, what was it, tornadoes? Right? Right? He was able to whip up tornadoes 
to kill all of Job's children. That's some power there. That, again, that he was given. And it talks about, in other parts of the Bible, that there are going to be miracles and signs which will be false signs, but still miracles. But what happens many times with Christians? If there's a miracle that happens, oh, God, Lord, thank you, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Okay? Because sometimes, I'm going to tell you, just because it seems like it's something good, that may not be from God. That may not be the best for you. And that leads me to my last one, which a lot of people miss, and I, I, ve- I struggled, and I didn't check with the elders, and I'm, I was getting the... Pe- there is a great two-minute vignette. Well, regretfully, there are three very bad words in it. <laughs> but let's go to Matthew. I'm not going to do it. Matthew 16, 23. Matthew 16, 23. And this, all of it kind of leads into this. And a lot of people don't realize this about Satan. And this is Jesus speaking when he was talking to Peter. Jesus turned to Peter and said, get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. And there's other translations that says that you have man's ideas or man's reasons for doing this and not God's. The vignette from it's called, I'm not recommending the movie is before before the change, but God uses everything. It's called The Devil's Advocate with Al Pacino and Keanu Reeves. It's near the end of the movie, and Keanu Reeves has been through all sorts of things, and he finds out that Al Pacino's got Satan, not God, he's Satan. And in the vignette, or at the end, Keanu Reeves has lost everything. He's lost so many things, and he's still trying to be faithful to God. And Al Pacino says, who are you carrying all those bricks for? God? God? And he goes, God, why do you do that? God, he's, he's the, God is the biggest prankster. He tells you, look, but don't touch. Touch, but don't taste. All of these thing, things, but me, Satan, I am man's biggest defender. I am man's, I am the man, I, even with all of man's flaws, I support him in what he does. I help him in what he desires. And truth be told, folks, he does. He helps us in our desires. He is the biggest defender of man. And that's the biggest challenge because we want what we want and Satan will help us to get what we want. Satan's job, he wants us to walk away from God and he will help you to do that in whatever way works the best in your personality. People think having a lot of money and having great lifestyle and all of those things, that is God's blessing. You know what? If you never come to Christ, Satan's the one that put the money in your bank account to make sure that you never came to Christ. The relationship, you have this relationship, it's a beautiful guy, beautiful woman, whatever it is, but that family raises kids and they never come to Christ? Satan's there to make sure that that family never goes and sees who the real Christ is. But the rest of the world thinks they're fantastic. But we'll say, oh, that's just a blessing from God. And these are good people going to church. There are people going to church who are, quote, unquote, reading the Bible, and they're going to be the ones that Jesus says, I never knew you.
One of the things I didn't have time to do, we have this, again, the perception of that Satan's pitchfork, ugly. You have all these things from the dark ages, the pictures of things. Please understand, first of all, we know clearly from Revelation, he's an angel. There is a debate, and I'm not going to get into it, but you can read Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14. In there, some scholars believe that's a depiction of Satan. Some believe it's not. It talks about the king of Tyre and the king of Babylon. Okay? There is a roaring debate back and forth. There's many scholars on both sides of it. There is nothing in the Bible that talks about what Satan looks like except maybe those. And what it says about him is that he's the most, one of the most beautiful angels. So we're talking about someone who can make themselves look as beautiful to our flesh as possible. So we need to understand that this is who we're dealing with. Someone who constantly lies. Someone is very deceptive. Someone who has power. And someone who, for our fleshliness, will support us to the end. That's who you're dealing with. That's who we're dealing with. So we must prepare in advance to be able to go against our enemy. To be continued. Amen. Well, that's the, the introduction. That's the, the first part, the groundwork of what we're going to be covering for the next few weeks. And I, I want to emphasize a couple of things. I coach. That, that is the gifting that God uh, has given me. And in coaching, no matter what sport I am doing, if I am in that sport, I take time, if possible, to go in what, what we call in coaching, scout our opponent. And that means go look and investigate to see what they do well, what, the, what their areas of weaknesses are, their tendencies, to understand them. Because in understanding your enemy better, and I don't like to think of an opponent in sports as not a, a, an enemy. I don't think of sports that way. It, and I'm probably going to do something on sports in a little bit. I'm doing some research on that as well. Because sports, I see sports as two, whether it's people or teams coming together to help each other become better, like iron sharpening iron. And it's not about, for me, about winning or losing. It's about glorifying God and becoming better. So, but in doing that and being the best that you can be in that, you do want to analyze what your opponent can and cannot do, what is good at, what they're not good at. This is also what you do in sales. If, for example, if you were a provider of a service or a product, your job is to find out all you can about your customers so you can meet their needs. And you want to meet their needs in such a great way that they are delighted to recompense you, to provide you funds for that product or service. Because you're providing such a great product or service. It is worth them investing money in purchasing that product or service. But you can't find that out unless you do significant investigation of what your customers' wants or needs are. I can give you many more examples. But we don't do that for something which is at a much higher level of need for us is understanding that we have an enemy and understanding what he can, what he cannot do, what his weaknesses are. Is that we need to know that. And so this is a first step in helping you understand that. And you need to research it for yourself. You're always going to hear this from me, those of you who are new uh, to me. Don't just take my word for it. You need to go back and read those scriptures, read other scriptures about this. And we will continue. This is episode one. We will continue episode two, God willing, next week here 
at a church in the world, or again, we want to coach you, coach you up for the glory of God. I pray you have a great rest of your week.